introduction to Katia Finite and Element Analysis webinar today. So before we begin, let me just tell you a little bit about ourselves in Trinsys. So we were established in 1998 um, as an engineering consultancy using DASA Systems products, so Katia being one of them. Um, we're a PLM consultancy which operate alongside an engineering business and our UK's largest and best source DASA Systems business partner. Now, as I believe, we're actually the biggest in the Northern Europe um, region, so not just in the UK, but within Northern Europe. Um, we employ about 64 people and have a turnover of about 12 million. That's the PLM side of the business. And the engineering consultancy side employs about 85 people with roughly a turnover of 20 million. Um, we also have four offices in the UK and one office is overseas in South Africa, so with a total of five offices. What do we do in the PLM side? So we sell software, DASO products uh, primarily. So things like a new 3D experience platform, so it's basically an what it is is a single unified environment for areas of the business. It's trying to incorporate procurement with analysis, design, everything all in one. Then we have Katir, which everyone's familiar with, uh, Inovia, Data Management, Delmir, Simulia, which you guys are familiar with as well, um, is the FEA um, and simulation tool set of DASO, um, and Transcat, and some other ones as well. We also do consultancy work, so implementations and project management, and also do in-house software development. So if anyone wants some bespoke software or bespoke add-on for Katia, we can um, aid or design um, the product ourselves. And we also do training and help desk, so that's a large part of our business as well. So we provide training on all softwares that we sell, and we do help desk for all um, customers. The engineering services, so we do design consultancy. We could take something directly from concept all the way through to detailed design, um, material selection, prototyping, etc. Um, we have a dedicated um, an analyst, um, so we do structural analysis. And some of our expertise are things like press tool design, casting and mold tool design, etc., etc. So it doesn't mean everyone's an expert in these. It means few of my colleagues will know a lot more about one thing than the other. But between us as a team, um, we can do anything. So let's get straight into this webinar. So this webinar is basically an introduction to Katir um, embedded finite element analysis. Um, so that's looking at um, part structural analysis and sh assembly structural analysis. So throughout the webinar, I'll give you a brief, brief overview about the product itself, what additional products you can get to boost your analysis cap capabilities, and then I'll go into a demonstration which will show you just like a basic analysis being performed in Katir. So there's essentially two sides. There's Katir and Simulia uh, when it comes to DASO systems products. So if we have a look at this current slide in front of us, we have the GPS, GAS. So GPS stands for basically part structural analysis and GAS assembly structural analysis. That comes in a package which is GAE. Okay, so if you were to um, obtain a GAE package, you'll be able to perform both part and assembly analysis. If you then decide that you need more advanced capabilities, you can go into the facts. Um, package, which will also give you, obviously, the assembly and part design, uh, part structural analysis, but also give you dynamic response analysis, advanced meshing and meshing options, so advanced, advanced surface meshing and solid meshing as well. Okay. Now, if you wanted to do further your analysis, so you maybe might want to do nonlinear analysis or um, thermal analysis. So FACTS is limited to uh, linear elastic analysis only. Okay? That's where Simulia comes into it. So the Simulia add-on is basically an abacus product. So you can start, you can start doing nonlinear heat transfer, uh, nonlinear structural analysis, and also rule-based automatic meshing. So it gives you additional, uh, more advanced meshing tools as well. Okay? The GAE is basically for um, designer level analysis, so anyone any designer that just wants to quickly validate a component without bothering the analyst to perform a, a quick analysis, um, they can do that with a GAE package. Um, the facts it just gives them 
bit more advanced capabilities, and then the Simulia add-ons, which gives them a lot more capabilities. So we're going to be focusing on the GAE side for this webinar, and um, we'll just primarily just talk about what FACS and the Simulia products can do. So for Genesis Structural Analysis, GPS, it, it, which is um, for solid parts, or surface or wireframe. So you can create analysis of solid, surface or wireframe geometry, um, which obviously means you get a 3D mesh, 2D mesh, or a 1D mesh. If you use 2D, give it a thickness, uh, 1D, um, give it a cross section. We can also add virtual components to this. So if you want to simulate an assembly, you can do in an idealized environment by using virtual components. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, transparent automatic meshing, so basically all you need to do is just specify mesh size, bam, it's done. Uh, we don't need to worry about it failing, it can pretty much mesh anything. Um, it's easy to use, standard pre-processing and post-processing capabilities, okay, and simple solving options, so single case and small to medium sized models. But we can also perform modal analysis as well. So the meshing size, what does that include? So you've got an octree solid mesher, an octree surface mesher. So the solid mesher will be a tetrahedron mesh. Um, a surface mesher will be a triangular mesh. And then you have the beam mesher as well. You can also get virtual parts as meshes as well. Someone might ask, well, what exactly is a virtual part? It basically is a, is a um, mesh where it's a predefined element type. So if you need like a um, rigid beam element, for example, between two components. You could use a um, rigid virtual part, for example. Okay. Um, properties, so you have solid properties, shell properties, beam properties. So as I mentioned before, with the shell properties, you add a thickness, beam properties, a cross-section. It has isotropic materials and smooth and rigid properties on the virtual parts as well. Okay. Pre-processing. So you've got the standard loading, so just like a point load, um, uh, point load, bearing load, uh, not bearing load, sorry, uh, pressure, force, uh, accelerations, imposed placement, etc. And you have standard restraints such as fix um, and user defined as well. We can user define any restraints in any degrees from rotation or translation. And you can also add mass as well. It's solving capabilities, so you've already got static analysis, frequency analysis, single case management, so you can only um, manage one of the cases. And you can also do an adaptivity computation, which is basically um, being able to uh, converge your mesh size to, uh, with regards to the stress as well. Post-processing, so you've got the standard post-processing, so we can view displacements, von Mises stress, principal stress, um, animate. Uh, the deform shape, perform cutting planes, contour plots, add global sensors such as view maximum stresses, maximum displacements, and you have a standard reporting as well, which is included. Now with the GAS, which is a genetic assembly analysis, so again, it's a um, product ge um, geometry. Um, you can do basically a you can add connections between um, various different parts to say that we're in contact or basically telling Katia how they interact. Again, you have the same meshing capabilities essentially. Uh, it says remote connections. That's basically saying that two parts are in contact. So that's the remote connection. Um, again, you have different connection properties at assembly level. So a bit like virtual assembly components, if you will. You can have uh, rigid connection properties, contact connection properties, beam connection properties. And then solving, you can also do bolt tightening analysis, pressure fittings, etc. So we don't need to, if you want to do a bolt tightening analysis, you don't need to have a bolt modeled in, for example. You can just use the solving, the bolt tightening um, capabilities. We also have a dynamic structural analysis. Okay, so frequency with time response, excitation through modular modulation, um, solving based on model or superposition, etc. Okay, so again, pre-processing, you have time and frequency, uh, implos displacement, damping definition, 
and you can solve for frequency response and time response as well. Again, post-processing, additionally, you can add sensors follow-up, so you can measure time and frequency domains as well. So that is more part of the um, fax, so GDY, that will be part of the fax configuration, as will the EST, so this gives you um, the Elfini structural analysis capabilities, so advanced properties, you can now use composite materials, um, advanced pre-processing and post-processing. You can now manage multi-cases as well, advanced cases, etc. Okay. So things like we can do with the properties, we can have membrane, shear panels, um, orthotropic materials, composite, import of V4 FEA models as well. Um, Pre-processing, advanced loading such as bearing loads, thermomechanical loading, data mapping. So data mapping is basically if you had all the pressures um, that need to be applied on a face as part of maybe like a text file, you can import that as a data map and it will apply the load at a position at that magnitude. Um, inertia definitions, groups, etc. Again, solving, we can now do buckling cases, combination cases, and static constraint modes as well. And post-processing, we can now um, measure reactions, uh, strains, um, and so on. Okay. FMS, so again, part of FACS, um, advanced surface meshing capability. So it allows you to basically um, add local meshing to um, surfaces. Uh, smooth meshing, allows you to view mesh quality, etc, etc. So if you wanted to get a bit more out of your meshing, rather than just throw a mesh on something, say it needs to be a certain size, it's um, FMS that you'd be interested in, the advanced surface meshing. Now, moving on from facts, we've now got um, the Simulia product, so such as um, ATH, which is nonlinear heat transfer analysis. So basically you can compute temperature distribution of a part or an assembly. And what it does, it actually uses the Abacus Solver technology. Okay, so what you would do, you'd pre-process it in Katir, submit the job, it would use the Abacus Solver, and then bring it back into Katir for post-processing. Okay, so properties-wise, meshing-wise is the same as um, FMS. Um, properties-wise, you can now te uh, take into account uh, material temperature dependencies. Pre-processing, you can have thermal loading, heat conduction. Um, between contacting parts and assemblies, etc. Solving, again, you can solve for conduction and convection and steady state and transient analysis. And post-processing, again, you can get um, specific images to heat transfer this XY plot history outputs, etc. ANL, so nonlinear structural analysis. Again, properties-wise, you can add nonlinear materials, so hyperelastic materials, any materials um, that deform well, in fact, you want to add um, uh, plasticity to, et cetera, or take that into account. So you can add that all in a tabular format. Pre-processing, so you've got advanced contacts, automatic contact detection. So um, you can just pick, find me all my interactions, and it will find them. Fasten contacts, take into account friction, and press fits as well. Um, solving, so nonlinear static, multi-step analysis, we can now start looking at large displacements, natural frequencies, thermal analysis, etc. And again, with the post-processing, we're going to get XY plots, history outputs, and um, plastic strain, etc. Okay, so the Simulia side is if you really want to get into your analysis, more to analyst level, moving a, a lot more away from design or ne designer level analysis. Okay. So, as I mentioned, I'll give you a demonstration of how these tools work, what the interface looks like for an um, introduction to FBA and Katir. We'll be focusing on the um, G, um, GAE configuration, so GPS, GAS, so part structural analysis and assembly structural analysis. What we will do, we're going to focus on this part here which is essentially a cantilever beam which is supported at one end um, by support. So we're assuming that it's fixed at one end. Now, what we'll do to begin with is just look at the beam 
own. So we're going to analyze the beam without any of its assembled components. So in the assembly, it will be assembled to a support. Now, what I've got here in my standard part, so this is what everyone should be familiar with. I've got a part with a material applied to it, so aluminium is applied to it. With the part open, I can just go to Start, Analysis Simulations, and I'll find my Genetic Structural Analysis work then, so that's, a, that's what's included with the GAE package. With the Facts package, you'll, start, you'll see Advanced Meshing Tools as well. And then it'll bring in the model, okay? Now, we have to choose the analysis case, so with the GAE package, you'll just have Static Analysis. And now we're ready to build our model. So the mesh is already assigned, um, the property is already assigned, and the material is already assigned. Now, just to spice things up, what I'm going to do is just cancel that. I'm just going to remove the material. So there's no material applied to my part. Now, again, if I go into a structural analysis workbench, it's telling me material is not properly defined on cantilever beam. Just OK it. Static analysis. Now, if we have a look in the tree, I'll just show you how the tree works. We have links manager. So what we've actually got here is a completely new file. Uh, to be precise, it's a .cat analysis file. Now, this is separate from the part file itself. It's a bit like a product file. So where you have a .cat product, where it's looking for links with individual parts which are in the product, this is what the analysis file does as well. The analysis file stores information about the element model, but it has no idea how the part was created. So in this case, it just has a link back to the cat part, dot cat part. Okay. okay, so let's get going. So under link, you'll see that's the link between the analysis file and the part. And then you've got your full part underneath. To go back to the part, you don't need to go switch window. You can just double click on the part node, and it will go back to part design or whatever uh, part workbench was in before. And to go back to the analysis, just double click on finite element model. So let's just collapse that. Now the finite element model, that's where your mesh is stored. So your mesh will be found under nodes and elements. Your property, so your 3D property in this case, because it's a solid, it's found under properties. And material, that's where the material will be found. So if had there been a material applied at part level, remember I've deleted it, you'll see the same thing without the exclamation mark. The reason why there's an exclamation mark next to material is because there's no material applied. Now because Katia has made a property, you can only create a property if a material is applied. It sort of created a fake material which doesn't actually exist. So the mesh. If I want to double click on the mesh, I can double click on it at the octree tetrahedron mesh level, and I can change the size. Um, so let's change that to 10, whether it's linear parabolic elements, so let's choose linear. So parabolic would be the elements with mid-side nodes, or the second order elements. Okay, you can also uh, modify the mesh by double clicking on the representation in the center. And with the property, the reason the property has fallen over is because the material isn't defined. So the first thing I'm going to do is create my own material. That's done by using user material. And just to keep it simple, let's just use aluminium. Okay. Now, if I wanted to, I could change the properties of the material. If I just right-click properties, I'm going to change the name to aluminium. And if I double-click on the material, and go to analysis, I can then change the isotropic properties of it. And again, because I've got all licenses, I can change various other properties as well. Okay. Now, I need to define the new material to my property, so I'll just modify the property, use a defined material, and pick the material. Okay. One thing that's important to note is if I go back to the part, it has no material applied. So this user material which I've created within the analysis file is stored with the analysis file. Okay. It's not stored with the part itself. Now, if I want to visualize the mesh, I can do so. I can just right-click on Nodes and Elements, Mesh Visualization, go on a Compute, OK, and there's my mesh. Now, if I just go back to Shading with Edges, you'll see the mesh. 
Now images, so these is produced now an image, is basically a representation of the mesh. Now in the analysis workbench, you don't hide and show. We now start getting used to activate and deactivate. So that's our alternative to hide and show. If I deactivate the mesh, it goes back to the solid. If I activate the mesh, it will show me the mesh. If I just hide and show, it just literally hide and shows the rep. Now all I'm going to do is apply a load at one end. So that's best done by picking solid geometry. So all I'm going to do is clamp one end. OK. And let's just add a load on the other end. Now, while I clamped one end, you could see what I did was is just select clamp. But on the restraints toolbar, I have various different other styles of restraints. So what, what do they all mean? Well, pretty much every constraint, well, not pretty much. In fact, every constraint under here can be mimicked by yourself by using user defined restraint. So if I select user defined restraint, Again, you've got restraint, translation 1, 2, 3, rotations 1, 2, 3. So it's ro translation in X, Y, Z, rotations in X, Y, Z. Everything has six degrees of freedom. Now, with the axis system, we can, use, we can specify our own. Okay? So if I do user, I can pick my own axis system. If X, Y, and Z is other than the part global, just pick user and pick the access system from one of the parts or the part that you want to use. Since I have, since it's in the part global, I'm just going to leave that as global. Okay. Just cancel that. Now things under here, so I've got predefined restraints of so things like surface slider, slider, sliding pivot, ball joint, and pivot. Some of these are only applicable to virtual parts. Okay. Now all it basically does, such as slider, is essentially the same as doing virtual part restrained in translation, not restrained in two, maybe X, uh, Y, and Z. This then means that it can slide on the Y and Z plane. Pretty much selecting the surface slider and selecting the support as maybe the Y, Z face. That will allow it to slide in the Y, Z direction. So clamp, again, that will just mean all translations are locked off. Okay. So I've clamped the end. I'm then going to add a load. So I'm going to add a distributed force on this face. Now, if it's not in Z, not in Y, and not in X, what you can do is, let's just say it's in the, let's say minus Z positive Y direction, just for the purpose of this illustration. Okay. I put a 1 in it, y, a minus 1 in z. I can then say, well, the actual load is, um, let's do 0 0.5 kilonewtons. So if I do kilonewtons, it will translate it to newtons, but it's also worked out the components in y and z. Okay? So we can, we can be a bit, la um, I'd say lazy, but let's say efficient about it. Okay, and there we go. Now, if I run the analysis, I can choose what I want to compute. Okay, so I can compute all. I've already computed the mesh, so I don't need to. I can just compute the analysis case in this instance. Okay, and just pick the case. Now, before I go and analyze, you can see I've got my restraint. So restraints and loads are all stored under a case. So the model itself, so the mesh, the properties, and the material, are all shared, are shared, sorry, between the multiple cases if you have more than one. Let's just run the analysis. Let's just say all. Don't bother selecting preview. I'll just show it. I'll just put it on just to show you what it does. All it will do is compute an estimated estimation of the amount of memory it needs and the time it will take. It's pointless information. Okay, so take preview off. Run the analysis. Bam, it's done. Okay, appears nothing's changed, which it hasn't. But the way I know it's computed is now I've got these three options, which are my images. So I can view the deformed mesh, form my stress image, displacement, principal stress, etc. So you could see when I was looking at the well, mice's image, 
it's still showing me all this horrible grey stuff. Essentially, we want to make sure our visualization is set to shading with materials. That gives us a nice plot, a nice contour. Now, in my opinion, if you're doing a fancy image for a manager or someone like that or a customer and you want to show them how good your model looks, this is perfect. But for an analyst, it's not that great. We can't really see the boundary between the elements. So I like to use customized view with edges and points visible and material shading. Then I can see uh, the contours between the elements. Again, the contours are smooth, so what I could do, if I double click on the, um, the graph on the side, go to more, um, again I can impose maximum minimums on boundary, number of colors, on a change of colors. If I take smooth off, you can see it gives me a clear boundary where it goes from one value to another. If I do an impose max, so let's say what shall we do? Let's put five. You can set, you can see it shows me the maximum value, the true maximum stress value calculated, even though my imposed value is lower. Okay. Again, the different distribution modes, etc. Number of significant figures, whether it's decimal, scientific, etc. So you'll do that by double clicking on the color contour. Now, if I want any additional images, so all these one, two, three, four, five aren't going to be enough. So if you right click on the static case, you can say generate image. Now, these are all the results. So images essentially are a result that you want to visualize. These are all the images or results, as you will, that you're allowed, that you can um, display. So that's what's been computed. Again, if you don't want to see any of these um, icons, you can just hide and show. If I want to animate it, on the bottom toolbar, I'll have um, animation capabilities. So if I just drag them out, there we go. So I can animate, increase the time, go to more, wherever it in both times, animate color, animate deformation, etc., etc. You might also find sometimes the magnitude of the uh, um, of the deformation is too great or too small. So at the moment, it's been magnified just over, just under 17 times. And again, it's true magnification one. Let's animate that. It's barely deflecting. Okay. So you may need to increase your amplitude, uh, your magnification factor to really make it visible. Again, you can do a cross-sectional view. So if I drag the compass, drop it on somewhere, it will place the plane parallel to it, and just move the compass to drag the plane along. Okay. And again, same with rotation. If you want to clip it, show section, view section only, etc., etc., reverse, and so on. But unfortunately, you can't keep it on the screen, so it's only available when you show the tool itself. Now, one other useful thing is an image extrema. So I can say, show me global extremers. Now it's showing me that the maximum stress here is at this node here. Again, if I go to image extrema, there's only ever going to be one global one, so it doesn't matter if you put a value in more than one, there's only ever going to be one. It's now showing me where the minimum stress is and at which node. Okay. And again, for local regions, I could say, well, show me the next most local one. Okay. So it's done that there. By default, it won't show me the label, but the label is now stored under the image itself. Okay. So if I go to my local, say show label, and it shows me the next local one. Again, all your images are now stored under your solution itself. Okay. We could, let's just hide those extremes add a sensor. So I could say, well, I want to create a global sensor which shows me the maximum displacement. And now under sensors, maximum displacement is just over two mil. So sensors are essentially other is, is a measuring tool. So that's what a sensor essentially is. So we've seen how quick and easy it is to do an assembly. 
uh, so part, um, what if I use an assembly? Now, before I go into an assembly, I just want to show you why CATIA can be quite good at analyzing um, where restraints are missing. So let's just delete that restraint. I'm going to create a user restraint, and I'm going to purposely miss out translation in X and run the analysis. Take preview off. And it's going to complain that there's a singularity de detected in translation. So factorized, matrix, computation, fancy words. You just get used to the idea that it's un not restrained properly. Okay, so rotation constraints were not taken into account, being a being a, um, a 3D mesh, so a 3D property, it doesn't take rotations into account. So whether you have them on or off, it doesn't matter. But now, it still lets me generate, even though it's failed, a de deformed shape, and I can animate it, and it's sort of shooting off in X, which gives me a good indication that it's not restrained in X. So this is why... This is why Katia analysis is quite quick and easy to use. So what if I want to analyze a, an assembly? Okay. So let's just add the material back to the part just to make it easier. Okay, let's just close that. I don't need to save it. Okay, go back to my assembly. Now with the assembly open, if I go into the analysis workbench, I'll create a static case. Same thing applies, but now you'll see I've got two meshes, a mesh for each part, two properties, properties for each part, and in this case, two materials, because each uh, part had its own material. Okay, so you can see there's no problems with any of this. Visualize both meshes. I can right-click on the nodes and elements. Mesh visualization, computer mesh, okay. There we go. So I'm happy with that. What if I only wanted to visualize one of the meshes? Well, you can actually modify your images. So if you right-click on the image, Go to Object and Definition. Selection, I can pick the mesh I want to view. Okay. View all or view, if you don't have anything selected, it will view all anyway. Okay. So, being an assembly, I actually need to tell it that these two components are um, connected. So, Katia doesn't second guess where components are connected. If I just hide the image itself, so where is it connected? Well, it's connected at the um, the, other, the reverse face of this part to this face. Okay. So if I go back into the assembly, the best way to do that is is if I fix these components, I can move them apart. So you probably have them constrained, which they are at the moment. So all I'm going to do is just move one part aside. Next thing you may ask yourself, well, I'm going to put a connection between this face and that face. But is that true? Uh, not really. It would only actually be in contact with a small portion of this face. So what you may want to do, so this is why you may have separate um, files for analysis, because you'd go around simplifying, removing chamfers, fillets, um, small features that will make a massive impact on computation time, and to add additional features. So if I just go back to this part, I'm just going to create a measure. Um, I can't remember what size it was. So if I find my measure toolbar, there we go. In fact, I measured the wrong thing. Let's measure from one edge to the other. OK, so it looks like it's 20 mil by 20 mil. So on the support, I'll just create a sketch on this front face. I'll create a rectangle. Of twenty mil by twenty mil. Oops, twenty. Twenty. There we go. So exit that workbench. I'm then gonna fill it. And then I'm just going to go back into part design and sew it onto the face. Sew so that without simplifying geometry, sew it in that direction. Hide the set. There we go. I've got two separate faces now. Okay, so because it's already open, I don't need to save it. 
there we go, it's in the middle. If I just change visualization, you'll see it. Now, if I go into the, assemb uh, the analysis which I'm creating, I then need to tell Katia that they're connected. So I do that by using a general con uh, analysis connection. So what I'm going to say is, it doesn't matter really which way around you pick it, that face is connected to the second component, that face there. And it creates like a link. What you can't see um, is it's actually going to create, um, it's going to pair up the, um, the nodes on each mesh, even if they don't align perfectly or do that all for us. We, it'll take care of it. We don't need to worry about that. OK. I'll just snap this analysis back together now. OK. So you can see why I moved it apart just to aid in my selection. Now, what I've got in the tree under my link is the analysis connection manager. So under that, I have my connection. So in this case, just one. I've told it is connected, but I need to tell it exactly how it's connected. Okay. So to do that, I need to choose a connection property. So I'm going to say it's in contact. Pick the support, which is the connection that you've created. And I'm just going to, just to simplify it, say it can't slide. Now, is that true? No, it's not in contact. It's actually a um, fastened connection. So it's basically um, a rigid connection. Okay. And now you can see I've got a fastened connection mesh and a fastened connection property. Okay. So it's actually created both for us, the mesh and the property between the two. Now, we'd assume that this support won't move. So all I'm going to do is clamp it. And I'm going to apply the same load on the other side, so distributed force on this face, and I'll carry on with the same direction vector. Run the analysis. Remember, don't be scared if you don't know if you've got everything ready. Best way to check, I've got connections. I've got all, to, all meshes, all properties, all materials. I've got a restraint. I've got another load. It looks like I'm ready to rock and roll. Okay, so let's just analyze that, run the computation. There we go. It will finish. If, if there is a problem, Katia will tell you. It has a habit of coming up with these um, lovely error messages, which you need to try and um, translate. But none of that at the moment, so that's great. Check the deform shape. We don't want to have it deforming up and down when I've added a component force. And there we go. So there's my assembly. Okay. Now, what I could do, if I just wanted to view the, me um, the result on one mesh, I could right-click on the image, go to Object Definition, and just say, well, show me the beam itself. Well, I might want to see what it looks like on the connection. Whoops, wrong one. On the support. And there we go. We can see what impact it has on the support. Okay. Now, if I was to choose Displacement, Hold on, if I zoom in, it's sort of given me a direction vector. So at each node, so if I hover over them, it tells me the information at that node. It's not a nice view I like. So what I can do, I can change the way it represents this view. So again, if I right click on the image, go to definition, I can do an average ISO or a text. So let's do average ISO, I can do a vector component, let's do normals, and I can probe. So I can say information at that node. And it'll tell me where the node is, what the value is at that node, and so on. Okay. And then you can see what else has it created. If I look on the links, it's now got a results file and a computation file. So the computation file is the big file where it's done all the mathematics. The results file is basically uh, all the images that you can see. Now, you can, if you run multiple iterations of this um, analysis, show it in a tabular format. So if I'd run this multiple times, so let's say if I change the load. Uh, in fact, let's just change the mesh size. Uh, let's say 15. So I've run it for a second time. So now I've got a historic. Uh, basically, a history of the computations, and it shows me how it's changed. Okay, so there's only two iterations, so between iteration one and two, 
how the global error percentage um, um, has now decreased or increased and so on. So as I'm aware, a global error percentage of 10 should equate to a 4.9% stress error. So I think, I think generally worldwide, um, generally it's regarded as a 10% um, error in stress is um, about okay, which equates to I think roughly about a 24% global error rate. So at the moment, the results I'm seeing here just simply aren't good enough. Okay, so I'd, I'd go down and refine the mesh further and so on, basically decrease the size of the mesh. Okay. We can also generate a report. And it will just tell you nodes and elements and just create a basic report for you. So you can take this and and modify it yourself as well, add more information, less information, or you can just present this to anyone that wants to view the results as well. You could also, if you right click on the case, export the case as well, okay? And import it into another case. Um, you can also, let's show an image, export that data as a text file, as a free XML, and so on. So you can export it in various different formats. So that's basically a general overview of a, um, the uh, GAE package um, and just an introduction to the Katia Embedded FEA tool. So what could you do next? So next steps, you can actually have a look at our blogs. We have a lot more information in our blogs. Um, there's a couple in there about analysis in general. Have a look on there. If you go onto our blog, you'll see we not only it's not limited just to Katia, there's various different hints and tips you can gather. Now, if you're having a problem about something um, specifically, you can just go to our website as well and just search. So I could search for FEA, for example. And not only does it search all our events, it will also search our blogs as well. So you, if you look through this, you might find items from our blog as well. So you can use this as sort of like a, um, a knowledge base as well. If you want to learn more, you can go to our training website. So you can inquire about coming on our Katia FEA course and actually having full two days, having a go at all of this and seeing how it's all done and having one-on-one -on -one time with a tutor as well. Alternatively, you can contact us as well. So you can contact us and ask us for custom demonstrations. If you have a quick question, you can just email support at intrinsics.com. And if you just um, have any other various questions about pricing or anything, please feel free to contact us. So www.intrinsics.com forward slash contact. If you just want to see um, what we're doing, stay informed. Again, you can add us on Twitter, um, on YouTube, LinkedIn. We're on Facebook as well. There's various ways you can keep in touch, um, find out more about us and find out more about Katia FEA as well. That basically concludes the webinar I had planned. So thank you guys for all for listening. I'll take some questions uh, for now. The best way to get any questions to me is by asking questions within the GoToWebinar box on the right-hand side. So please feel free to ask any questions at the moment. Uh, just wait a couple minutes in case someone's typing. Um, if not, this is basically the end of the webinar, so um, there will be a recording available as well. If you missed something or something wasn't clear, you can come back and rewatch the webinar as well. Um, the link will be emailed to all to you guys all at a later date.
Okay, I've had a question about um, mesh quality percentage error. Um, at this stage, I don't really have that much more information about it. Um, I can find out some more information. Again, I have a wide um, office full of uh, knowledgeable analysts, so I can get to gather some information and get that through to you. Um, Okay, I've got another question here with regards to, um, just bear with me, find it. sorry, the applet's got a really small window, so I have to scroll up and down. Okay, about um, the difference between linear and second order mesh in terms of reliability and quality. Essentially, this is my advice, you want to be using second order meshes. Um, let me try and illustrate the point in paint. So. I use linear um, elements if I just want to quickly run an analysis, see if it's going to work, make sure it deforms correctly, and then I'll uh, use parabolic elements. Uh, especially when you have, if it's just a square block, linear elements are fine, it's all got straight edges and so on, but when you start having fillets or quite a complex faces and surfaces, you want to be using second order elements. The reason is, if I create a straight line, now linear element, that black. So what the red thing is basically a node, so you've got a node on each end, and that's your element. Now a second order element essentially you get a mid side node. Okay. So one would argue, well why not half the linear element size? It's because of this. The, um, there we go, that's better. It's because the mid-side node element or a parabolic element can actually deform parabolically. So it can take a more realistic shape of anything that's curved rather than deforming like like so. But again, it dramatically affects your computation time. So you want, if you're not sure if your an analysis is going to work, I recommend using linear elements, large mesh, run the analysis, works, deforms correctly, then refine the mesh and go into a, um, a parabolic or second order elements. So just see if there's any more question guides. Okay. Okay, I believe that's it. So thank you all guys for listening. And I hope you enjoyed the webinar. And remember, keep um, keep viewing our website. So if you go to intrinsis.com, look at software and events, you'll see all our up and coming webinars um, for our technical tips Tuesday. Thanks, guys.